tonight we're going to be having a sacred cow barbecue. Our main scripture is going to be from Mark 7. So some of you may be wondering what a sacred cow is. Okay? The definition of a sacred cow is something untrue which has been accepted as true for a long time. The term comes from how people in India believe that cows are sacred because they believe cows possess the souls of the dead. So, now that's in India. Churches in America and across the world are not preaching the truth of God's Word. They're preaching sacred cows or traditions of men that render the Word of God powerless. Amen. These traditions blind us and keep us from understanding the truth of God's Word, and that's called deception. Satan also tries to keep you from knowing the truth because it's the truth that you know that will make you free. And of course, Satan doesn't want you free, does he? He wants you to be in bondage. Even Christians, he wants to keep you in bondage. Okay? Um, a problem today is that the truth of God's Word doesn't mean a lot to most people. Most people in the world, the truth of God's Word does not mean a lot to them. That's right. Did we lose our sound? No, there we go. So people don't believe in the authority of the Word. In fact, I know Christians who will find things in the Bible that goes against what they want to do and say, you know, I believe that's just a suggestion in God's Word. So, most people believe what they want to believe, whether it's true or not. And they're not about to let the Word of God stand in the way. So let's read our scripture for tonight. Mark 7. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. All too well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down. So Jesus is condemning the religious leaders for believing in and then teaching sacred cows. Amen. Tonight we are going to barbecue five sacred cows. They're untruths that the church is believing today, or many in the church. And how we're going to barbecue them is by learning the truth of God's Word. Right. So let's start the barbecue. <laughs> okay. Sacred cow, number one. I look like the animal. Hey, hey, Dennis, would you hook up the, that laptop to the... I have some sound effects on that. She can't do nothing to happen. Be sure to get it back to the start, baby. However, the Old Testament law and the New Covenant of Grace, they don't mix. Amen. They're like oil and water. There's even a dramatic difference in the way that God dealt with people in the Old Covenant, covenant and the way He deals with people under the New Covenant. Under the Old Covenant of Law. If you did something wrong, God, the wrath of God would come down on you. Under the New Covenant of Grace, you see tremendous mercy. And of course, that's the lady that was caught in the glory. God did not condemn her. So it looks like, you know, either there's two different gods, or maybe God's schizophrenic. No. Will the real God please stand up? 
Y'all remember to tell the truth? Mm -hmm. <laughs> About the first 2,000 years that man lived on the earth, man lived under no law. Did y'all know that? I thought the Ten Commandments was from there again. Got 2,000 uh, years there. So even though man was sinning, God was not charging them with their sin if he was merciful. Romans 5.13 For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. A good illustration for this period of time before the law was given is found in Genesis 4. When Cain murdered his brother Abel. But instead of punishing Cain, what did God do? He put a mark on Cain to protect him. Isn't that odd? That sounds strange in the Old Testament. There are, however, two notable exceptions in this period of time when God was not charging man with sin. That's the flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says the wickedness of man had become so very great and these two destructions were actually an act of mercy to preserve the human race. He could just wipe us off the face of the earth right then when we were so wicked. So it's like having a rapidly spreading infection in your leg that they cannot cure. And they may, may, they may take drastic measures and amputate your leg, but what does that do? That saves your life. So these two destructions were like that. Amen. So the first 2,000 years, man was not under the law. God was merciful. But people began misinterpreting God's mercy, thinking that he condoned sin. And sin became rampant. About the next 2,000 years, Man lived under the law. Once the law was given, God started holding men's sins against them and punishing them for their sins. Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. A good illustration for this period of time when the law was in effect is found in Numbers 15. When the very first person to break the law was a man who was picking up sticks on the Sabbath day to build a fire to cook them a meal. And he was stoned to death. That was the very first man who sinned under the law. Now, for about the last 2,000 years, man lives under God's grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He even died for Hitler's sins. Amen. That's hard to believe, but he did. A good scriptural illustration for this period of grace is found in Romans 6. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. Did you know the body of Christ was never intended to be under the law? The law was written to the Jews and for the Jews. This verse says that Christians are not under the law. The church has preached the law, or some churches have, and made many Christians legalistic and law-minded. Some ministers today even try to manipulate their flock by, cur by threatening them with curses and um, law from the Old Testament and telling them things like, if you don't pay your tithes, yeah, if you don't pay your tithes, God's going to curse you. People that don't even love God will shell out that tithe money like it's hush money. Amen. It's not God the Father. It's more like the Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> you pay your 10% I'll stay off your case this week. That, that is legalistic and not the right motive for giving. So what was the purpose of the law? The law was instituted to condemn us so that we would see our need for a Savior. Right? Amen? Romans 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The law 
wasn't given so people could keep it. The law is a ministry of condemnation. If you feel condemned today and you are born again, you've got an Old Testament law mentality and you don't understand the new covenant of grace. Amen. Under the new covenant of grace, condemnation is not from God. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies? Who is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is also risen? Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? And the implied answer is no. Christ is making intercession for us the total opposite of con con condemnation. So any condemnation a born again believer feels is from Satan the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night. So how long was the law supposed to last? Until Jesus came. Yes. Galatians 3.19, the law was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. The law was only meant to be temporary. Now Jesus offers salvation to everyone by grace and through faith. If you've been born again, God has placed the punishment of all your sins on Jesus. Amen. God is not mad at you. All your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. You don't have to go around feeling guilty, unworthy, or condemned. Start walking in the freedom and liberty that Jesus offers to you. Amen. That's right. So some people want to say, well, you know what? If I'm not under the law, I'm going to go around and do all the sin that I want to do. No. What? No, sir. Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Sin is a direct inroad for Satan to come into your life. And he comes for no other purpose than to steal, kill, and destroy. Let me get some water. Sacred cow. Every time you sin, you lose fellowship with God. That's false. Religion says our sins are forgiven only up to the point that you get saved. There's a lot of confusion in the body of Christ about forgiveness of sins. We hear some preachers say that when you get born again, and I heard this too when I was growing up, your sins are forgiven up to that point. And every sin you commit thereafter is going to affect your relationship with God. Yep. Right. So you've got to hurry up and get that sin confessed. That's right. And there's varying degrees of this belief. That's right. Some, one camp believes that every time you sin, you lose your salvation. And if you were to die in that situation, you'd go to hell. Another camp believes that you wouldn't lose your salvation, you'd lose your fellowship with God. And he wouldn't answer your prayers until you repented of that sin. Both camps actually believe the very same thing. That your relationship to God is based on your performance. The Bible says the love of God is not dependent on our actions. But God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's called unconditional love and it's not conditioned or based on your performance. That's right. People who believe the sacred cow go around all the time with a sin consciousness contrary to what the Word of God preaches or teaches. Hebrews 9. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? These people don't doubt that God has all power. Oh, they believe in his power. They just don't think that he would ever use his power on their behalf because they know they don't deserve it. But the truth is, None of us deserve the love of God. Maybe you've done nothing right. to deserve the love of God. However, the good news of the gospel says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you are born again, sin is no longer an issue between you and God. God already forgave all of your sins. God is not dealing with you according to your sin anymore. Jesus dealt with your sins on the cross once for all time. And you will not be condemned for any sin at the judgment seat of Christ if you are born again. 1 John 2.2 2, And He, or Christ, is the propitiation or atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only ours, but also for the whole world. Now every person has a spirit and a soul which con contains your emotions mm -hmm. and a body. When you are born again, your spirit is perfect at that moment and remains perfect through eternity. As perfect as it will ever get. And your body and your soul are being perfected and will be perfect in heaven. Amen. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For by one offering, He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Amen. Amen. Good verse. <laughs> Sacred cow number three. That was a little anxious cow, wasn't it? <laughs> God's will always happens. No. That is false. There's that old buzzer. Religion says that whatever God wants to happen will happen. You know, that's rather a convenient theology. Because that way, you can just sit back and relax. You can watch As the Stomach Turns on television every day, take no responsibility. You don't have to seek God or do anything. After all, God's will always happens, and nothing would happen unless it's God's will. You know, that reminds me of a song. <laughs> Religion says that's false. Yep. 
Religion doesn't say that. I say that. The Word of God says that. Religion says tragedies are from God. Now the people who believe this would say, God loves me so much. He's liable to strike me with cancer. So I'll be a better person. But it's actually Satan that's putting bad things on me and in your life. Look at Acts 10, 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. It was the devil oppressing people with sickness. Not God. That's right. Yes. That's right. There are four truths from God's Word we can see about this sacred cow. Number one, Satan tries to steal the Word through persecution. And in the parable of the sower, the one sown on stony ground, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So tragedies and sickness are from the devil. And his purpose is to block the word of God from taking root in your life. Another truth from God's Word is that God never uses evil to draw us to Him. Romans 2.4 says, Do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Another truth from God's Word. Good things come from God. The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father Amen. of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God doesn't give out good gifts and then sometimes give out bad gifts. That's, right. That's not the nature of God. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. Another truth is that God corrects us through His Word. Amen. That's right. Not through tragedies. That's right. Second Timothy says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That that's why it is vital to stay in the Word of God. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now lots of people, even those who are not saved, Quote well, Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called or be called according to His purpose. That verse, however, does not say that all things come from God, does it? No. No, it says that He can take anything, even the bad things from Satan, and bring something good out of it. That's right. Look at that last part of that verse. Those who are the called according to His purpose. What is the purpose of God? For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. So all things work together for Christians who love God and who are destroying the works of the devil. Are you in that category? Yes, ma'am. Amen. Some people may be wondering, well, then why are so many bad things happening to me? Well, there's two obvious answers, and it may be a combination of the two. One, we have an enemy, the devil, who is attacking us, and that's called warfare. And the greater your destiny, the bigger the target on your life. Another reason may be that Christians are welcoming the devil into their lives by willingly living in sin. And the devil comes into their life to destroy them. And we studied in our buying study that uh, sin includes not only just actions, but sinful thoughts and even sinful attitudes that many Christians overlook, such as fear, discouragement, worry, and especially unforgiveness. Amen. Sacred cow, number five. This is the last one. For me, it's the best. The best way to overcome sickness is prayer. Hmm. That's false. There we go. Religion says to be healed, you get a prayer chain going and get a hundred people to twist God's arm and make Him move. It is not God's turn to move. Jesus already moved 
2,000 years ago. He said it is finished and then he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. Jesus, through grace, has already provided your salvation, your healing, your prosperity, and your deliverance 2,000 years ago. Now the ball is in your court to take by faith what Christ has already provided by grace. This is like a man who is dying of thirst. He has been lost in the wilderness for days without any water. And miraculously, he stumbles on a well. And there's a bucket and a rope, and it's filled with clean, delicious, cool, refreshing water. But he's just leaning up against the well saying, Somebody, I'm thirsty. I need, I need some water. And then miraculously, some people do walk by. And he gets them to hold hands and form a, hand, form a circle, a prayer chain around the well. And they all start praying for that man to get water. That is utterly ridiculous. The best way for this man to get his water is to use his power and draw the water out of the well. That's right. That's right. Many Christians today are begging God, Oh God, please heal me. Pretty please. And some say that God can heal me if He wants to. His Word says in 1 Peter, by His stripes you were healed. Right. Now let me show you how much He wants you to be healed. in Mark 11.23 the most powerful way for you to overcome problems and receive your healing. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. This verse shows three keys to overcoming problems and receiving your healing. The first key you must speak three times. This verse says to speak because your words are powerful. Your words are powerful. Everybody say that with me. My words are powerful. Amen. <coughs> We're back to the fruit. Proverbs 18. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. These verses say that every word that comes out of your mouth is like a seed. Every word you say is going to germinate and produce something, and eventually you're going to eat the fruit, and your life will be full of that fruit that you've been speaking. If you're constantly saying bad words, even words that you don't mean, you're being yeah, because the truth is, you will reap what you speak. Amen. Now, our good friend Martin Luther, do y'all remember him? Yes. From Abiding in the Vine? He wanted to say something again. This time he says, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. In effect, he's saying, you can't keep random bad thoughts from popping into your head. But the good news is you can keep them from causing your trouble, causing you trouble. That key is found in Matthew 6, 31. You take no thought, say, do not speak those bad thoughts and they will not have power over you. Do not speak negative words. Now, if you're yeah. sick and someone keeps pressing you, man, you look horrible. Are you okay? What's wrong with you? Are you sick? Well, don't lie. But here's how you handle that. Well, I may look sick, but I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Or it may seem like I'm broke, but God promises to prosper me. Or it may look like I have this problem, but 
God is going to set me free. Yeah. You just yeah. got to make sure you put your butt in the right place. That's right. <laughs> the words are death or life. This is not only for words you say, but the words you read and the words you hear in music and even the nightly news. And sometimes words are used as weapons. Isaiah 54 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. Immediately counter those weapons of words that rise up against you. Don't leave them hanging out there in the air. Amen. The television says, it's, it's the flu season. Hurry up and get your flu shot. Those are curses. The Bible doesn't say there are certain seasons when the Word of God doesn't work. That's right. Immediately counter those curses. I rebuke that curse Amen. in the name of Jesus. It's Woo! not flu season for me. I don't right. believe in the flu. Amen. 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 The second key to overcoming and receiving your healing is you must believe. That's right. It says the person who does not doubt in his heart but believes. You either believe and receive, or you doubt and do without. Now when Jesus cursed the fig tree, Matthew's gospel said it died immediately. And Mark's gospel said it was about 24 hours later before there was a noticeable, physical evidence of what had happened. So likewise, when you speak and release the power of God over your sickness and problems, sometimes it takes some time for what has taken place in the spiritual realm to manifest in the physical realm. That's right. Some people think, well, you know, if God had really healed me, I would have seen an instant miracle. If you think that, you will get in unbelief, and you will not see the power of God. There are different ways. There's two different ways to receive from God. One is through a miracle or by miracles. Two is by faith. That is when you rebuke the problem, you command it to leave in the name of Jesus, and it leaves. And then it manifests in the physical realm over a period of time as you continue to believe. Now, I want you to know that you need to expect the very thing that you're believing for to get worse before it gets better. Amen. And that's the enemy, our death, the devil in warfare that I was talking about. And what is he trying to get you to do? To get in unbelief. Because when you get in unbelief, you will not see your healing manifest. And I know Brother Tommy was saying that he, he knows of people that gets healed and a few days later, they're back sick again. So I'm almost certain that those people got that got in unbelief and lost their healing. That's what the devil wants to happen to them. The third key to overcoming and receiving your healing is that you must speak to your problems. You have to talk to the mountain, which is your problem. It's crucial who you talk to. You don't talk to God about your problem. You talk to your problem about your God. Amen. You use your authority that you have in Christ. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on servants, serpents, and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. If, if for example, you're having issues with your finances, Psalm 1, are y'all, who all are familiar with Psalm 1? Psalm 1. says it blesses the man who delights in the law of the Lord and then a few verses and it says whatever he does prospers. You stand up and say, whatever I set these hands to will prosper. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Yes, it's a promise of God. His promises are faithful and true. And things will talk to you too. Tell things, just like Jesus talked to the fig tree. In Mark 11 it says, Jesus answered the fig tree. That fig tree was talking to Jesus. And it said, I got figs, I got figs. Just like that. That big tree was a hypocrite. It was professing to have something that it didn't have. And things will talk to you too. Some people's checkbook is saying, look at all this red ink, brother. You 
are broke. Anything that talks to you, you talk back to it. You talk to your checkbook. Talk to your wallet. Amen. Talk to your bills. You say, bills, you are paid in the name of Jesus, and I am debt free. Hallelujah! God says, I gave you power, now use it. Use your authority. Speak to your problem. That's right. And in closing, a true story, whether you believe this or not, a man's mailbox was bringing him nothing but bills. And every time he got around that mailbox, he just cringed because it kept saying bad things to him. One day, he had had enough, got down on his knees beside that mailbox, and he began prophesying to his mailbox, you're bringing me more money than you're bringing me bills. I command money into you. True story, the very next day, he received a check for $10,000 from an unexpected source. Right. And Amen. things will obey you too. The Word of God works. Amen. Amen. Now I know I've been giving cows a bad rap today, but I want to say I have nothing against cows. I like the way they taste. <laughs> I pray that God would help you apply these truths to your life. Amen. And I'm turning the service over. Brother John, to close while I get the party ready. We are going to eat some cows. <laughs>